Welcome to Power Up, a podcast show hosted by Maurizio Di Paolo Emilio that brings life to some of the stories on Power Electronics Technologies and products featured on PowerElectronicsNews.com and through other Aspencore Media publications. In this show, you'll hear both engineers and executives discuss news, challenges and opportunities for power electronics in markets such as automotive, industrial and consumer. Here is your host, Editor-in-Chief of PowerElectronicsNews.com and EEWeb.com, Maurizio Di Paolo Emilio. Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of uh, Power Up. Today we'll talk about uh, GAN, GAN for motor control and LiDAR applications. Gallium nitride or GAN technologies revolutionizing the, uh, diverse applications from LiDAR systems to motor control. LiDAR employs uh, pulsed lasers for precise distance measurement, generating uh, detailed 3D images. GAN technology uh, serves as an effective driver for laser switching, handling high current and ultra short pulses. This facilitates higher resolution due to shorter pulse width and enables extended LiDAR range through elevated pulse currents. Moreover, GAN transistors are revolutionizing motor control in smart e-bike controllers, leveraging their wider energy band gap for enhanced performance at higher voltages, temperatures and frequencies. This empowers the controller to handle increased power densities, ensuring unparalleled efficiency, reliability and power density standards. Today, in this episode of Power Up with Alex Lidl, CEO of uh, Efficient Power Conversion, EPC, we analyze the groundbreaking impact of GAN technology in various applications, in particular LiDAR systems and motor control. We delve into its role in LiDAR, where GAN-based solutions are serving as effective drivers for laser switching, but also we explore how GAN transistors are improving efficiency and performance in motor control, such as e-bike. Let's talk with Alex. Hi, Alex. Thanks a lot for being here at Power Up. How are you? How's it going? Maurizio, it's going great. Uh, you know, I think that uh, most people right now recognize that uh, gallium nitride or GAN is, is uh, going to replace MOSFETs very broadly. Uh, the only question now is when and what is the sequence? Which, which ones go first and which ones hang out the longest? Yeah, yeah. Indeed, uh, today we will talk about uh, about GAN, GAN technology for motor control and LiDAR applications in particular. So as uh, the CEO of EPC, so let's analyze uh, the market uh, of GAN, in particular LiDAR and motor control with latest updates. So EPC has uh, introduced, uh, for example, 80 volt laser drive IC capable of 15 amps pulsed current for uh, time of light LiDAR applications, but also EPC 9194, so a three phase BLDC motor drive inverter reference design for e bikes, scooters, drones, and so on. So I guess this one, please correct me, in November. So, how is the company contributing to the development and adoption of GAN technology? And uh, are there any upcoming initiatives or projects that you would like to highlight? Sure. So, so you know, EPC has been in business longer than anybody else in GAN. Uh, we we went into mass production in 2010, so that's 14 years plus now. And um, you know, we've seen several applications that went past the tipping point, that have gone full on GAN and aren't going back. Uh, you know, and and I think that that's what we need to look at is where do the tipping points occur going forward. So, first one, the very first one was lidar. LiDAR crossed the tipping point from day one, and it's because uh, the ability to see long distances with great accuracy using time of flight of light requires a very high current pulse of light that's extremely short in duration. If you need to know when all the photons go out so you can tell exactly how long they've been out when they come back in. Uh, and so that was our first big application. Uh, and today it is still a very large application of ours. Uh, And it breaks down into two categories. It's direct time of flight and indirect time of flight. We can talk about those in a minute. But um, that was number one. Uh, Number two application was uh, DC to DC for high-density servers. And, uh, you know, we saw that as we went into, you know, cloud servers and Bitcoin mining servers uh, and then more recently AI servers, 
that the need for uh, higher current on the server board was such that you had to go from 12 volt distribution to 48 volt distribution. And so they still needed to convert down to 12 volts. Uh, and so on board, they would have these 48 to 12 volt power supplies. Uh, and now today with AI servers, all of them are GAN based. Uh, that went past the tipping point uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, then the third area was space. And space is an obvious one, and it's just about as obvious as some of the uh, land-based uh, systems. But in space, size, weight, and efficiency are extremely valuable. And GAN not only is always smaller and more efficient than silicon, um, uh, and of course it weighs less as a result, but also uh, it is radiation resistant, uh, really radiation hard much harder than silicon. So you don't need shielding. And uh, so you can get state-of-the-art performance without any weight added for shielding. So those three areas went past the tipping point. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, certain areas in motor drives uh, following. Uh, you know, we had motor drives in space now for a few years because of size and weight and efficiency. But now we're seeing the adoption in other flying objects like drones uh, starting at the larger drones, and uh, also in robotics, uh, where size, weight, uh, in particular, are very important. And from there, you know, it, it rattles on from big, uh, you know, high density servers to less density servers, from you know, um, satellites to uh, terrestrial uh, systems like drones in aerospace, and uh, and of course robotics. And then final, finally, you know, power tools, which are also adopting uh, GAN right now. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, on just for our listeners on powerelectronicsnews.com, there is an interview, an article with Alex uh, about uh, space uh, GAN for for space. So uh, let's back in terms of lidar. So pulsed lidar technology is uh, is used for long distances with the direct measurement of how long a photon has traveled the, the round trip distance. So this is, as you mentioned, called the time of flight. Uh, so time of flight is, uh, is easy, is simple per itself, but uh, it uh, measures the, the, round trip, uh, the round trip time. The LiDAR laser must be driven by a circuit to delivering a larger amount of current in a short time. So uh, let's see. So this, of course, given the high power involved, this switch, uh, must be a component with the parasitic inductance zero or close to, to zero and with the ideally infinity switching speeds. So let's see where GAN is better than silicon, reliability, integration aspects. How does the reliability integration of GAN uh, would compare to, to silicon in uh, these circuits for driving uh, LiDAR lasers, particularly uh, in terms of delivering high current in a short uh, in a short time, and what characteristics of GAN would make better convenient over over silicon, in particular parasitic inductance and switching uh, speed. So considering those, so so there's there's a few components to creating an extremely high current pulse that's very narrow. Uh, one of them, of course, is the device has to be able to switch the laser very quickly. Uh, so the device itself has to be fast. Now, uh, silicon is nowhere close to as fast as GAN. Uh, you know, so GAN is is actually 10 to 100 times faster. And that comes from the fact that the mobility of electrons are higher. And also the distances the electrons need to travel is much less because uh, GAN has a higher critical electric field. So you can move the terminals closer together. They travel less distance, they have less resistance. So that's how you get a faster transistor. Now, a faster transistor doesn't do any good if it has to feed all that current through an inductor. Uh, and so the, the next challenge, of course, is getting the parasitic inductances down as low as possible. Uh, in early LiDAR systems that use discrete uh, GAN transistors, of course, that meant uh, moving the GAN device as close as possible to the laser and also making sure that the laser itself is designed for LiDAR. And that meant, uh, you know, not having, you know, wire, long wire bonds or, or high inductance laser packages. Um, and, you know, it was discovered that because GAN is so small and even chip scale has no package, that you could really get it close to that uh, laser 
And by getting it really close, you got rid of a lot of the parasitic inductances. So that was a big breakthrough. Lots of LIDAR systems built that way. And then we came along with integrated circuits that took the rest of the circuit uh, and put it on the chip so that you eliminated a couple of other parasitic loops like the gate, uh, uh, the parasitic gate loop and the common source inductance loops. Uh, and that allowed things to go much faster. Now, initially our ICs were you know, 10 and 15 amps. Uh, this year, in 2024, we're introducing them up to 125 amps. So we can do you know, short range, long range, all range LIDAR systems. So before moving in terms of motor control, last one about, uh, about LIDAR. So LIDAR systems often face challenges related to noise. So noise is an important element for laser. So how, how does GAN technology contribute to noise reduction in uh, LIDAR signals? So there, is a, there are specific noise-related uh, algorithm mechanism that GAN helps mitigate. So, so there's noise and there's interference. Um, so you send out a pulse of light and it bounces back and, you know, you have this detector. The detector nowadays, they, they, they are of a great variety, but they're usually avalanche detectors. And um, the most popular new ones are the single photon avalanche detectors or SPAD uh, detectors. And they actually can detect a single photon, <laughs> which is uh, kind of amazing to me. Uh, and uh, they do it by biasing a diode very close to avalanche, and then one photon will, will multiply through avalanche multiplication. Um, so the, the detector itself uh, is noisy in that if there's, you know, the single photon is mixed up with a bunch of other photons, it's going to give you a noisy signal. So number one, you have to have, uh, you know, frankly, a good repetition of photons in order to get a clean uh, understanding of distance and resolution. So you have to pulse the laser multiple times. Now, that's okay. And that's what people do. But then there's the other issue is what happens when one car with a LiDAR system is driving at another car with a LiDAR system, and they're both pulsing their lasers and the photon detectors are going crazy. Uh, and for that, um, they are using uh, unique codes. So you pulse a few times in a rather unique way uh, and then the receiver can either understand that that's you know my pulse or it's somebody else's pulse, uh, and uh, you know that just requires very very rapid multiple pulses in order to preserve both the integrity of the signal uh, and uh, you know the resolution and the distance. So moving on motor control. So how is GAN uh, technology being uh, utilized in uh, e-bike drones robots? and similar. So what performance enhancements does it offer in terms of higher voltages, temperature, frequencies, any challenges associated with the widespread adoption of GAN advancement or innovations that are on the horizon to address uh, those advancement innovations? Yeah, motor drive is a really cool field because, you know, first of all, they're around everywhere. You know, there's lots and lots of motors. Um, and, uh, you know, the motors, and, and let's for the moment deal with lower voltage motors, uh, say, you know, 100 volt and less, uh, and we can talk about higher voltage motors if you want as well. But lower voltage motors are brushless DC motors. They tend to be driven with a three-phase um, um, circuit. So, you know, you, each of the poles is a phase, and you, 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 you pulse them so that you can create the rotor to rotate. You can have more than that if you want. Um, and in the past, they were done with MOSFETs. And MOSFETs have a unique characteristic in that they have a reverse diode. The reverse diode is relatively slow. And so what you need to do is you need to put in dead time in order to accommodate the, the recovery of the MOSFET. What that did was it kind of limited the speed of the motor drive to about 20 kilohertz. So today, all these brushes DC motors are running around right around 20 kilohertz or less. Uh, and what that, you know, so that has implications. A few implications are that it requires relatively big capacitors and input filters for that kind of a frequency, because what you're doing is you're recreating out of a bunch of pulses an AC waveform to drive the motor. Um, now, GAN doesn't have that diode, so um, you can go to much higher frequencies, and a miracle kind of occurs. As you go to 100 kilohertz, 
what happens is all your ripples go down and therefore your input uh, filters uh, become much, much smaller and you don't need electrolytic capacitors. You can go to ceramic capacitors. Ceramic capacitors are not only more um, uh, reliable than electrolytic, they're lower cost. Now, all of a sudden your system shrinks, it's far more reliable. And since you've eliminated that dead time problem, uh, that dead time actually causes a, um, uh, a vibration in the motor itself because it occurs you know, at a sixth harmonic. And that vibration takes, takes power away from the shaft. Uh, maybe about five, 6% of your cycle is actually removed because of MOSFET dead time. Now you get that back. So you have a system that's smaller, it's more reliable, it generates less acoustic noise, it generates less EMI. Um, and because there's a lower ripple and also there's less of this uh, um, dead time noise, which is significant. Um, and, um, you know, and, and what's not to like, it's a whole lot lighter. So first applications uh, in volume came from uh, robots where, you know, you need the arm of the robot to have low light weight so that it can move very quickly and you want it to be relatively high speed so it can move very precisely. Um, and also in um, what are called reaction wheels in satellites. And, and we went into thousands of reaction wheels just last year with all these new constellations of satellites going up. And a reaction wheel is, is basically a motor that is on a mass, it's on a, a wheel. And as you turn the wheel, of course, the satellite moves in the opposite direction because you're in space. And by having four of those wheels, you can then turn the satellite in any direction and you can steer it to you know point a camera in the right place or point an antenna or a solar panel in the right place so satellites tend to have about four of these uh, reaction wheels uh and, and that became very popular and it still is it's extremely popular and from there you know you can also imagine drones what a great way to make a drone lighter weight uh and more efficient which means you also get more battery life so starting at the heavier drones the ones that are used, for example, for delivery of, of medical supplies or of um, uh, delivery of uh, chemicals onto uh, uh, agricultural fields or ones that have to go way out into the ocean to inspect offshore wind farms. Uh, those are all going with GAN-based motor drives that, that really make a big difference. Uh, and from there, you can imagine, <laughs> you know, that same thing is, is useful for e-bikes uh, and starting off at the more powerful e-bikes, so we have uh, uh, a, uh, an application, for example, for an e-bike, and this is a ridiculous example, okay? I'll give you a ridiculous example, one that has uh, 1,200 uh, watts per wheel. It's two wheels. Both wheels have motors on them. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, 2.4 kilowatts of drive on a bicycle. Uh, it's, it's meant for adventure biking. Uh, but, you know, more likely, uh, more of these bikes are in the 700 watt and all the way down to 350 watt range. And, of course, this tiny little motor drive can squeeze inside the, the motor housing. And now we've also integrated a bunch of the components. So it's even smaller. It's even more efficient. Uh, so I see, you know, that being a, a significant trend. And from there, it goes into the even more competitive world of power tools. And there are hundreds of millions of power tools. So that's kind of the evolution, uh, as, as I've, I've shown. And there are many other little steps along the way. I do want to say one thing, though, about robots. Is I've really changed my mind about robots in the last couple of years, uh, probably in the last year. Is you know I used to think of these humanoid robots as a you know, uh, you know, circus show, uh, you know, this is great, but what do you use them for? You're not going to have a robot standing there doing stuff. That's crazy. You know, I have just an arm or whatever it is. Um, and lately we've seen a lot of very interesting design activities around, um, I'll say humanoid or semi-humanoid robots. Uh, and I'll just give you one example. We have one design uh, that's going into mass production, and it's a uh, um, about a 70 kilo robot. That's how much it weighs, 70, 80 kilos, maybe seven, that range with batteries. Uh, it has a 10 hour battery life, and it can carry 35 kilos of weight. Uh, and um, the initial price is is very high. It's you know like about 250 thousand dollars US, um, but 
but it was broken down for me by the customer said, look, it's expensive, right? But if you break it down, now you have a, 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 a robot that can run 24 uh, seven and uh, it, it, uh, it costs $250,000, but it can do the job of a human for 24 seven. And when you break it down for, I forget if it was a five or seven year life of the robot, it's $12 and 50 cents an hour. Now that's starting to look like the wage of a, I mean, it is better than a wage of a person. Plus, and this plus is for me, not from them. Uh, this robot is far less complicated than my car. And I know that if you build a million of these robots, it's going to cost less than a car. In other words, it'll cost $50,000, $60,000 instead of $250,000. So I think that you know, in warehousing functions, in, in rather simple, um, and, and I'll say low-wage uh, functions, there is a place for humanoid robots uh, that are built in volume. And, and, um, that has huge implications, you know, socially, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, basically the, a lot of displaced people, how do we retrain them? How do we, uh, you know, uh, re replace, uh, you know, put them into, into more productive uses. Yeah. A lot, a lot of applications in this, in this world, indeed the market. So the motor control market is, uh, <clears throat> multidisciplinary so it will require more electric electronics firmware engineers so a lot in this power for sure a lot yeah and and gan ic's particularly the monolithic power stages that we make are the ideal component for motor drives small lightweight they do a lot of the function of the motor so you just need to hook a controller up to it uh and and i think that's the way it's going to go and um in, in LiDAR, the ICs are the difference in, you know, super long distance, high resolution performance or not. In motors, I think that they are the difference in, you know, size and weight. Uh, so I think that that's where GAN ICs have their major infiltration today and going forward. And from there, it rattles down into all the other applications. So in terms of um, motor control, uh, so the mission is to reduce power waste in every motor application. Uh, so maybe just uh, briefly, what are the common uh, reliability considerations, failure mod modes associated with the CAN devices in motor <coughs> control? So uh, also, so how can engineers mitigate these risks? So this also considering the feedback from your customer who are using your devices. Yeah. Um, so, by the way, we're doing a motor drive specific reliability study that will be published uh, later this year um, to, to look at that. And so, n number one, you have to look about, you know, make the comparison with MOSFETs, which are relatively fragile devices compared to GAN. And the reason is that GAN is wide band gap, which means it has a very strong chemical bond, which makes it less sensitive to temperature effects. Uh, and in motors, you know, uh, there's some temperature effects. You want to locate them inside the motor housing, so there's higher temperatures. Uh, but also, you have a lot of start and stops, uh, and um, you also have more um, overcurrent surges in motor drives that are possible. Uh, things like, um, uh, you know, if you hit a curb uh, and your motor's trying to drive it over a curb, you know, that'll that'll lock the motor but it's still trying to move those are high uh, you know those are those are surges uh, again in general is better at, at handling those surges so for example our GAN devices um, without any special modifications can handle 10 microseconds of short circuit that's easy for them to do uh, and we've documented that uh, you know, in, in IGBTs, we had to detune the IGBT to have it last 10 microseconds. And MOSFETs will not last uh, even five microseconds in short circuit. So, you know, GAN devices will just withstand that rugged short circuit kind of thing that you get in a, uh, a robot that's, that's jammed against a wall or a, a uh, um, you know, an adventure bike that hits a big rock uh, and needs to get over it. Uh, so, you know, I'd say that the ability to handle high temperatures rattles through many, many overcurrent and over voltage situations that, uh, that MOSFETs aren't good at. Um, so speaking of over voltage, we've also characterized GAN devices, which tend to have a lot more over voltage capability than MOSFETs. 
Uh, and the failure mechanisms tend to be soft failure. Uh, so now, you know, we are specking uh, over voltage, uh, um, uh, over voltage capability in all our data sheets, uh, and it seems to be uh, handling motor drives very well. So, given the increased power density of, of GAN devices, so how do you approach heat dissipation, thermal management in motor control, but not only motor control, also in other power uh, application that you can mention? Yeah, um, and, and I think that that's uh, a very important frontier uh, because GAN devices are so much smaller. Uh, they, they tend to be more challenging in a thermal management uh, arena. Now, first of all, they generate less heat, so there's that. Um, but you still have to manage, the, you know, and so people want to take advantage of it. So they're still going to run the devices up to as high a temperature as they can. Uh, so a few things about GAN is, number one, is, uh, you know, we, we understood that from the very beginning. So GAN is able to be cooled from both sides, top and bottom. Uh, and that is a big advantage. Uh, you can get much, much higher thermal, uh, um, much lower thermal resistance by cooling in both directions. Well, that's great. But we also discovered that um, a lot of the technologies associated with getting heat out of the top or the bottom uh, were, made the assumption of much larger devices. So they weren't that great when it came to smaller devices. One example, thermal insulating material. That's the material that sits between your device and a heat sink. Um, and those thermal insulating materials were on the order of three to six watts per meter Kelvin in terms of thermal resistance. Well, we work with uh, uh, thermal insulating material manufacturers, and now you can buy routinely 18 watt per meter Kelvin uh, thermal insulating materials. And you know that means you get the heat out three times faster, and that means that something three times smaller can basically have the same uh, thermal resistance to a heat sink. So we've we've done a lot of that work. We also have done a lot of work educating. And uh, we have, for example, on our website, a, a thermal management um, tool, interactive tool, where you can put in all your, your characteristics and get out of it an understanding of what thermal resistance to expect. Uh, we also you know, show how you know, thermal vias in a PC board impact your thermal resistance, uh, how different types of heat sinks impact your thermal resistance. So we put a lot of work into it. It's in our books, it's on our website, uh, and it is an education because it is a uh, uh, something that is, well, it's, it's certainly more difficult than a large device, uh, and it is relatively new in people's uh, designs. So, Alex, in conclusion, so this, this uh, has been a great podcast uh, conversation about Ken with, with you. Just in conclusion, what key message or takeaway would you like our audience to have regarding the uh, re revolutionary impact of GAN technology and its role in shaping the, the future of uh, diverse applications? So, I, uh, you know, I tell everybody who listen, as sure as the sun comes up in the morning, uh, GAN will replace MOSFETs. Uh, they are already um, less expensive. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we run these challenges at, at trade shows, you know, uh, where we have somebody come up with their part number and we compare it against uh, a GAN price. And uh, about 70% of the time we win. In other words, GAN is cheaper. So it's cheaper, it's more reliable, it's higher performance. Uh, as sure as the sun comes up, it's going to replace MOSFETs. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the question is, um, you know, what's the sequence? And for our customers, when is the best time for them to enter into it? Uh, and that is becoming more and more clear to um, more and more customers every day. I'd say, um, you know, today, 70% of the people that we poll out there are either designing with GAN or considering a design in the next 12 months. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, in another three, four years, we'll see that number, you know, 80, 90 percent. Uh, so it's happening. You know, get on, get on with it. And looking forward to it. Thank you, Alex. Thanks a lot for joining uh, us at uh, Power Up. Thank you. Thanks, Maurizio. It's always good to, to talk to you. That brings us to the end of this episode. 
Stay tuned with more news and technical aspects about power electronics. If you are listening to this on the podcast page at eetimes.com or powerelectronicsnews.com, links to articles on topics we have discussed are shown on this page. Power Up is brought to you by Aspen Core Media. The host is Maurizio Di Paolo Emilio and the producer is James Ede.